Herkese günaydın. Good morning all and welcome. Uh, we have reached the last panel of the forum, which was which has been taking one and a half days, and I hope you are full of energy and having a good day. The last session of today is the is about circular urban economies, the role of new technologies, and uh, 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 the environmental impact of migration and uh, displacement. I'm going to start in Turkish, and microphone is off now. Şu an mikrofon kesildi. Duyamıyorum. Ha, tamam. Um, as you know, 3.5 billion people are living in the cities, and this number is expected to increase much more in the year 2030. The cities are the future of many people. People are facing poverty, climate change, health, and education-related services access problems, and all of them should be are expected to be resolved in the cities. When we look at the inequalities, the inequalities are a serious concern. More than 800 million people are living in the uh, slum areas, and this number is going up. The energy need is very high in the cities. Environmental pollution is uh, uh, very concerning. The cities are only 3% of the surface area of the world. However, when we look at the energy consumption, it's about 60 to 80% of energy consumption, and 75% of carbon release is taking place in the cities. As a result of the migration, some cities have doubled their population in a few years, and its environmental impact is very critical and negative. Besides, in some cities, because of climate change and because of natural disasters, are more affected. Uh, they are more affected from those problems because of intensity of population. A stronger uh, planning and construction of the cities is important for uh, minimizing the loss of uh, lives and uh, commodities in case of an emergency. Because of the migration, the infrastructure services remain inadequate, and this is causing vulnerabilities in social and economic structures. These problems have been affected and have affected affected all of us. The inequalities are causing internal turmoil and loss of confidence, and they are causing environmental and environmental pollution is threatening the health and economy, and that's constituting a risk for all the lives. A solution to all of those problems is to construct sustainable smart cities. And in this panel, we are going to talk about circular urban economies service provision and communication technologies between the governors and human beings, and finally, rapid interventions which would minimize the environmental impact of migration and displacement. Under those titles, we have very valuable guests. I would like to meet them one by one. Mr. Cemil Arslan is from Marmara Municipalities Union. He is the Secretary General. Baudi, I would like to apologize if I am pronouncing your name wrong. He is the Division of Foreigners Travel Documents Administration, Exit and Entry Administration Bureau, Shanghai Public Security Bureau, China. Harold Tucker is Bio City Sierra Leone Mayor, and Sir Taj Turhal is Project Manager in UNDP Turkey, and Ms. Carmen Vales is the Andalusian Agency for International Development and Cooperation, Spain, Head of Evalu Evaluation and Planning Union. And finally, Dr. Bor Baran Bozoğlu, the Director of Environment Engineers Chambers. Firstly, I would like to give the floor to Cemil Bey. Under the union that you are affiliated to, uh, the municip there are some municipalities. And how do they meet the increasing demand in face of increasing migration and displacement? And the climate change and zero waste policies, what do you do? What do they do about them concerning the smart cities? 
what are the best practices in the municipalities under your union? You have only eight minutes, and then we are going to take the questions later. First of all, I would like to thank you, NDP and Gaziantep Metropolitan Municipality and all the stakeholders for the invitation, and I wish it will be a beneficial and fruitful meeting. About the migration, migrants, well, there are hundreds of positive and negative remarks, but the negative remarks can be gathered under four headings, four titles. Those are the four titles, compl titles of complaints. First, they say migrants are distor dis uh, distorting the social peace. They are taking our jobs. Uh, three, they are causing disorders in public services. And fourthly, the migrants generally have a r bigger tendency for committing a crime. If you pay attention, these are all describing a load, a burden, a negative burden. Is this really the case? I'm not sure. I do believe that the refugee issue is about the migration. And the migration issue is about population and population mobilities. Now we are talking about migration or refugees. That means we are talking about the population mobilities. This is one of the biggest problems. Mr. Said Halim Pasha, one of the governors of Ottomans, said that if the history was an experience which was experienced in vain, sociology would not be necessary. Zoology would be enough for explaining humanity. So the life is, a pro is described as a process which starts with us and which ends with us. For two days, we have been talking about Syrian civil war. We are talking about it, and we are finishing our talks about that. Today, we are talking about urban urbanization urbanism actually those are the concepts which uh, were created as a result of migration starting from the beginning of 18th century young people and poor people started to migrate from the towards the larger cities of Europe to Paris and to London and for the first time in 1850s this concept was started to use the cities Actually, even we owe the even the concepts about the cities to the migration, and there is something specific about the Turkey history. Today's modern municipality uh, movement actually was created because of migration and foreigners. In the beginning of 1850s, the first municipality was established in the today's Beyoğlu district of Istanbul. The main reason was to meet the needs of the foreigners and migrants living there, and in time we have met some problems and for those problems we have developed very specific very special solutions some scientists do not understand migration they do they they do say that without understanding the concept of migration we cannot understand the the development adventure of humanity history are showing that something there are some lies actually the some things change and even scientific theories do change Malthus starting from the 18th said that the rapid uh, increase in population would cause would absolutely cause a uh, decrease in life standards but this pro this was proven to be wrong it was true in the beginning a uh, population increase what was absolutely causing a uh, worsening in living standards however in the 19th century this was this turned out to be wrong and with the increasing population the living standards would go higher there are certain reasons for that. According to the estimates of UN, there are around 270 million people who live in a different country from the country uh, from the country where they were born, and majority of them of them are economic migrants, not refugees. According to a survey of Gallup, this. In the world, there are 750 million people want to live in a different country if they can do so. It means roughly 15% of all the adult population in the world. Are, is this very harmful? No, it's not very harmful. A scientist called Michael Clement conducted a survey and he said in the world, if 
all the people who preferred to live in a different country were doing so, the GDP of the world would roughly be doubled. It's now we are talking about 83 point five trillion dollar global GDP if all people were fulfilling their desires and if they all migrated this GDP would be doubled according to the data of World Bank the migrants are going to going from a poorer country to a richer country are three to six times more efficient because the countries they migrate have stronger legal infrastructure, more open financial systems and the migrants are uh, generally more brave. They are more courageous in face of life. So actually we are not facing as big a problem as we think. The migration should be considered as a part of great population transformation and as a part of development. Only then we can deal with that. The work of mayors is not easy. On one hand, diversity and cultural differences should be managed. On the other hand, the urban identity and identity-based demands are there and there are some increasing authoritarian leadership, racist nationalism, uh, xenophobia and excluding policies should be handled all together. No problem can be neglected. However, all these differences should be understood as a part of population transformation and they should work about evolving that transformation towards a development in the future. So I believe the migration and refugee issue cannot be handled without taking uh, the population mobility and development into consideration. Otherwise, it is going to have a shortcoming and it's not going to feed the social benefit. And the mig migrants are not as... Uh, uncomfortable as they as we think the municipalities have a lot of technologies and opportunities we are talking about smart cities in general i believe that people who are governing the cities governing the towns have are not aware of a problem about uh, data management for example if i were a mayor Probably the first unit that I would establish would be statistics and analysis and data management directorate because having sound and safe, healthy data, you cannot manage anything. And today's this the biggest benefit of the smart cities movement today is the collection of data and the analysis of the data. We are all talking about a burden, but but this should be based on a data. For example, in waste management, we are talking about the increase of the waste under the mayors. I doubt that the mayors have this healthy data. I wonder the, how much of the increase in waste is because of the uh, increase of life standards and how much of that waste is caused by the migrants because as the living standards are moving up this is causing a difference differentiation in the uh, habits or, and habits of consumption uh, for two days we have been listening to the mayors and the municipalities they are doing in extraordinary work however without a holistic approach all this work is uh, causing a higher cost with a lower efficiency. Thank you very much for giving me this time. Thank you very much. Actually, we started with a negative introduction, but however, you talked about the positive impact of migration in development. It was very important and valuable, especially in the vision of smart cities, the analysis of the data and conducting this with a rather holistic approach is undoubtedly important for the development of sustainable policies. Right at this point, I would like to give the floor to Shanghai uh, Public uh, uh, Safety Bureau Entry and Exit Management Leaders. They have innovative 
uh, and, uh, and innovate works. And now, would you please share us some examples about what you do in Shanghai? Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today is of my honor to be invited to participate in this forum. And uh, I'm from the uh, immigration office of Shanghai. And, uh, you know, Shanghai is uh, a financial center of China. But almost 400 or 500 years ago, it's only a fishing, small fishing village. How can it become a, a so big um, metropolis during the last few years? Because we developed the city with uh, innovation, with opening mind, and uh, how to say, um, travel passes to build the city. And uh, currently, you can see we have around 24 million citizens. 24 million citizens is almost one third of the population of Turkey, right? And um, there are 200, almost 200,000 foreigners reside in Shanghai. As an immigration officer, we provide, uh, I provide some um, service to the foreigners um, visiting or residing in Shanghai. And next, I'd like to share some of our practice with you. Firstly, we set up a lot of um, visa service or residence permit service stations at every um, district of Shanghai. We have 16 districts in the whole city. Every district has a service center. And for, since last year, we set up a special immigration service center for the foreigners. In this immigration service of a center, we not only provide this kind of uh, visa application services, but also for um, permanent residence services. And uh, we provide some devices such as self-service um, machines for photography and uh, visa application or form filling systems. So people can do it very easily to apply for a visa, a residence permit to work or to study or to family reunion. And um, <coughs> by the way, we combine a lot of government um, authorities or local um, organizations to reside or to station, have station in our um, service center, say like uh, labor's um, service or legal consulting service or um, some um, social services for people living or working in, in, in Shanghai, say like uh, um, women and the children protection and uh, how to find a job, how to find a, a rent a house, uh, this kind of services combined together in this service center for people to live and to work better um, in Shanghai. Um, besides this, um, we also provide online internet plus government services. It's called the e-business through our um, daily job. For example, um, we developed our registration for accommodation service to the foreigners. Normally, people, ha foreigners have to go to um, police departments or police stations to register for the accommodation. And from this year, we improved our services. Any foreigner can use their cell phone and uh, uh, and uh, they can use the uh, website of our immigration service to locate his um, position and uh, register for his accommodation. Just like if we stay in the hotel, this hotel, he can do it right at the hotel. Not necessary to go to the police department to register. It's quite convenient for those people. And uh, for the visa and the residence permit application, people can do it at home or even abroad to apply it. We used our website, the WeChat site for people to, uh, it's an open site for people to apply for a visa or residence permit to work or study or to for family reunion. And they can apply for an appointment. Uh, it's about one week later. At the appointment date, they can appear to our office, any office in Shanghai, uh, we have 15 offices, and they can raise the application at the site and they can get a visa or residence permit right away, less than one month. It's quite convenient for people to apply for a visa for touring, working, or studying in, in Shanghai. By the way, we um, this year we also improved our 
um, job together with the labor's bureau. Normally, people uh, want to work, they have to get a work permit through the labor's bureau, and they get a residence permit from the immigration department. Now we joined these two per permits together. We set up a joint account, some joint counters at our office, for foreigners to apply for a work permit and the residence permit together. So it means you can raise an application at the same site with the same documents. Otherwise, you have to go to the Labor Bureau first, raise application with a lot of documents, okay? Then maybe one month or two weeks later, you get the permit, then come to our office to apply for the residence permit. It takes almost one month or even longer, and you have to submit a lot of do documents twice. Now you can r go to one site and raise one application and get two documents together within uh, almost uh, one week. It makes people quite easier to work in China, in Shanghai. Um, also, as a smart city, Shanghai is also making our great efforts to build a cashless city. People can u just uh, carry a cell phone and go everywhere in Shanghai without any cash. You can pay in a shop, restaurant, buy flight tickets, or train tickets, even pay the visa or residence permit, this kind of fees without any cash. For example, when you apply for a visa, we'll give you a receipt. And uh, on the receipt, there is a QR code. You can pay with the cell phone, with the QR code. Or when you pick up a visa, you can pay by your cell phone, scan it, pay by WeChat, by Alipay, or by uh, Union Pay. It's quite easy, no cash necessary, because sometimes you have to pay quite a lot. I think it's the, almost the same. For example, if you have a big family, five or six persons, you need to pay a lot of money for the visa fee or for the fee of a residence permit, maybe um, around 10,000 liters or what, for the whole family, for five years of staying. But if you pay by the cell phone, it's quite easy. You didn't carry so much money with you, right? So it's quite even uh, easier for you. Plus this, they can pay anything with the cell phone. And thirdly, we have also set up a lot of service stations for migrants interrogation or foreigner social interrogation in the city. Um, this year we have set up six migrants interrogation service stations in, in some foreigners gathered communities or school neighboring, neighboring communities. And uh, next year we will set up almost uh, 52 of, of around 50 service stations in all of the all over the city, as for the foreigners gathered communities or places, and uh, we are almost set up 100 foreigners um, interrogation. Sorry, not integration. Foreigners um, social integration service stations just for the people, the foreign people in Shanghai to know better about the city, know better about the community, and get trained just like a language training and uh, job training or some get some aid, support from the community or from the local society. And uh, we also set up a uh, Chinese language um, examination site at our office for people to go through the Chinese language examination because it's, it's necessary for foreign students to study in China. They need to go through the examination, Chinese language examination. And also it has, it's helpful for foreigners to apply for a job. If you can go through the Chinese language examination, you can get a better job it's because some positions need people can speak Chinese. If it's, you can only speak foreign language, maybe it's difficult to communicate with local people. Just like we have more than 600 big companies, it's called international, um, ex international companies. So they need this kind of persons who can speak Chinese also. So we provide this kind of services to make people live easier or study easier in Shanghai. I think I can yeah, touch some of some of Thank my Thank you very projects. much, Mr. Baudi. I have a follow-up question. In fact, you yeah. know, indeed. Uh, 
Evet. Innovation is at the heart of an effective and efficient public service delivery. And what about the ones that are uh, left behind? Uh, how do you ensure the accessibility uh, of your services, uh, especially for the people who are, who are called disadvantaged or vulnerable in their own communities you that do not have the access to the digital the technologies, phones, like mobile yeah. phones, and yeah, that's great. Mo most of people, shy citizens, I think uh, they have uh, cell phones, one or two, even three cell phones. But for some foreigners or some disadvantaged people, with the older people or the children, they may cannot use this kind of digital service uh, or equipments. In this way, I've, j I've just mentioned that we set up a lot of service stations near the community, the foreigners' communities. They can um, register at the nearby uh, service stations. By the way, we have a lot of volunteers or some um, social um, service people uh, at every district or, or some co communities. They can do it to help the foreigners to do it. They can go to the buildings or some, some, some place just like schools uh, or, or the companies to help them, the foreigners, to register if they cannot use these kind of things. We have, uh, it's called uh, foreigners uh, involved, or foreigners involved service people. And uh, some people can speak a lot of language, just like English, uh, Italian, or French. They can speak foreign languages just for help people to get used. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see that, you know, Shanghai is a, a smart city and also has lots of uh, innovative experiences. Uh, to reach out the most vulnerable population. Our next panelist is our, uh, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, Bo, uh, Bo uh, Mayor, uh, Harold Logi Tucker. Uh, you know that uh, Bo is, uh, is, a, is given an award of the cleanest city recently, and we would like to hear your experiences, especially in terms of how you respond to the increasing internal displacement in your own region. Thank you very much. Hello. Good morning, everybody. And I want to thank uh, the organizers of this forum for my invitation. And I'm here today adhering to all protocols and also to share my vision of a sustainable city, a circular urban economy, and the impact of migration and displacement on our environment. I will start with my country, Sierra Leone. It's a small country that is located in West Africa, right between Guinea Conakry and Liberia. Of course, at the moment, I will, sit, I will state we do not have any political problem, we do not have any civil war problem. But as a country, we have participated in receiving and managing refugee and displaced persons situation. We have a small population of about 7 million people, and our economy is heavily reliant on diamond, bauxite, gold, and so many other minerals. Unfortunately, for a country as small as this, as rich as this, we were faced with a very brutal war in the years that destabilized our country, and it was compounded by the existence of Ebola that has brought us to this level. However it was, we managed refugees from Liberia because they also had war. We managed refugees from Guinea because there was a spillover in the, in the, the borders of Conakry, Guinea. And from estimates, these refugees had a toll of about over 100,000 people. And UNHCR, the World Bank, and several donors participated in managing these refugees in de different areas in Sierra Leone. But I must concentrate on where I come from, and that is Bo City. As you rightly said, Bo City had been acclaimed as one of the best cities in the country, the second largest city in the country, and the cleanest city in Bo in Sierra Leone. We have also invested and worked along with refugees, but mostly internally displaced persons. The kind of migration that are taking place in Sierra Leone have been one that had involved political, political issues, 
over 20 years ago we had one, which was just the nearest district to Bo, Bo district, Bojan district, who had a political problem, and Bo was the first point of touch that hosted over 100,000 people also. It took only eight months, but we managed it well, and we participated in their resettlement back to their home. Another that came was the Ebola virus. It also devastated and caused a lot of internal migration, and Bo was another stop. But what we will say is the lessons we learned from all of these migra migrations, both internal and external, had been waste management, health and sanitation, environmental depletion, and also joblessness of people. And that is where Bo is coming in to share our experience. Bo is a city that is growing beyond our expectation. And as a result of this kind of urbanization, we have focused ourselves to making sure that we prepare ourselves very well for both to be, continue to be a smart city, a city that will accommodate people in emergencies. And as a result of that, we have noticed that in the next 25 years, the population of Bo, which is about 250,000 people, will triple. And as a result of that, there could be high growth rate of urban unplanned infrastructure. It could be a high rate of growth of offshoot settlements. And of course, at the end of the day, it would tell a lot on the council that is responsible for service provision. However, the government of Sierra Leone is very keen on making sure that the environment is, is clean, very keen on the protection of the environment and also assisting councils to make sure they plan their cities. The past five years ago, we have spent all of our time making sure we try to put together a planned city. And as I speak, we have 17 words and these words have been planned to face the emergencies, to face a settled city to face a city that could grow well to the estimate of its people. What is interesting today is we have spent so much time having an economy, an economy that is linear, and now we are moving to an economy that is secular. We have made sure that waste is minimal in terms of taking into the dump sites by recycling and reuse. And also, we have established a system where we have a waste industrial investment zone, which is like the hub for waste and sanitation and waste management in Bo. And it is on record that from Bo City, we have rolled over waste management to two other cities, Makini and Kenema. And they are also fairly doing well. As a way forward, our final aim of the Bow City is to able to align the economy socially and, and environmentally for to achieve sustainable growth and to make Bow City more resilient. We are changing the current model of production and consumption in our economy. A change that is not only technological but also cultural and of consumption and production patterns. We attract trying in the next year to unveil new technologies in the areas of urban planning, in the areas of registering our properties, and we are aligning the registration and assessment of our properties to waste management generation, where we'll look at, uh, or at the property and its inhabitants to know the capacity of their waste generation. And we are making sure it is the people's centered Argument and arrangement. However, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, these gains will enhance the council with very good revenue generation. I want to also inform this house that we have worked with other partners, other partners in the UK that are commanded both city in the areas of urban planning and spatial planning. 
The reason be that because of its untidy nature in the past, we are trying to make sure that a, an urban city like Po is, is very con compressed and has potential to allocate different communities for different arrangements. I also want to say, we could be talking about migration, we could be talking about internal displacement, but probably today we could act as advocates so that our communities and our societies and our countries become very democratic, become transparent, and also allow the people to take their faith into their own, or into their own hands. And I want to thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again for your valuable contributions. I see that Bo is a city, a smart city, that uh, reflects uh, integrated response to sustainable development that is brought by the migration and internal displacement. And I'm really impressed to see how uh, this uh, grows, uh, this leads to the economic growth and social justice and peace. Thank you very much again for your contributions. Our next panelist uh, is Sertaç uh, Turhal. Uh, he is the project manager in UNDP Turkey. As you may know that Turkey, uh, UNDP Turkey has been managing a huge uh, program on uh, Syria crisis response and resilience. And one of the pillars of the work is uh, mainly addressing the municipal support, municipal infrastructure work that Sartaj Bey also leading. Uh, I would like to ask you your experiences, your reflections about uh, working with municipalities, especially in terms of uh, waste management and the recommendations for future steps. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak in Turkish. As you know, UNDP, there, there has been a crisis since quite a long time. But before talking about the crisis, we would like to talk about the structure of the municipalities. The municipalities are making their investment plans from their central government budget and from their own budgets according to population projections. Starting from the first day of the crisis, these projections lost their validity. For example, yesterday, Ms. Mayor Fatma Shahin said that they brought water uh, from 150 kilometers away. Actually, this investment was planned for 10 years, maybe 15 years later, but they had to do it today because in uh, Gaziantep there are about half a million refugees. So any municipality, it's not possible for any municipality to arrange investment plans according to such a sudden change of population. If you ask the burden to the municipalities, we can talk about environmental and financial burden. If we talk about the environmental burden, the refugees pressure to municipalities is like you and us. For example, an average person in Gaziantep produces one kilogram waste and a Syrian person produces 0 0.9 kilograms of waste. It's almost the same and it's very close to the ordinary citizens. But this is an extra burden and the municipalities needed extra investment for meeting those needs. It at that point, in order to support the investment plans of the municipalities and central government and for the involvement of UNDP, we have started an approach as UNDP. Actually, there are three axioms. One is coping, the other is recovering, and finally, transforming. Starting from the first moment of the crisis, the fundamental services was very important. All of a sudden, as it was mentioned yesterday, over one night, 15,000 people arrived. In one year, the population increased by half a billion people. So the fundamental needs had to be met primarily. And UNDP started working with that at the first stage, which was called, which we call coping. And many uh, service vehicles were uh, uh, provided. For example, firefighter uh, vehicles were uh, purchased. 
in the number of fires extended very high all of a sudden it was doubled so first of all we have uh, bought fire fighting vehicles and we have also purchased waste collection vehicles in the southern southeastern uh, cities we have bought 105 uh, service vehicles service car vehicles but it was just not plastering a wound we then passed to the second stage it was about the environmental dimension climate change dimension carbon release dimension we, we try we are trying to advance with a certain plan and integrated solutions first of all we need to create an integrated solution we have to make an assessment and we make a decision together with the local government uh, the solid waste is an, is an important area because one of the biggest expenditure items of the municipality is the solid waste that's why we have focused on that since 2014 first collection of the garbage then the transfer of that is a high cost item and then the uh, elimination of the garbage is an important work however there was a value chain however this extra population increase uh, broke that chain so there's no more chain anymore uh, first the collection of the waste with the uh, vehicles then there are in Gaziantep we have two uh, solid waste transfer stations we have uh, provided efficient transport of the garbage or waste as you know in the metropolitan municipalities there are one or two landfill areas and the carriage of the waste from one point to another point is a high cost and it's a high carbon footprint and there was no landfill and they were using wild storage areas and it was causing a huge carbon uh, formation and it had a negative impact on the climate change we stopped it we have established eight transfer stations so what do you do when the field arrives to the landfill uh, the storage is not enough and the main goal is the garbage does not should not go to the landfill and at the moment we are establishing a mechanic this differentiation biologic um, degradation facility we want to in, uh, produce an income for the municipality and we produce biogas so that the garbage does not go into the landfill this was the second part now I'm going to talk about the third part which is most important thing for us the transformation According to us, a municipality, if makes a correct investment, they can save money up to 40%. As you know, the municipalities are political entities, so right investment might not always be the right investment. As you know, they are elected every five years, there are elections. So what do we mean by uh, investing in the right point? There is a need, but we don't need to uh, feel it's not good to meet that need with a plastering approach. There must be an integrated management. In this scope, we are trying to optimize the systems of the municipalities. For example, when you change the garbage collection regime, the municipality can uh, save money. And when we use the system of solid waste transfer system, the municipality saves every year about one and a half million liras because of this new system. And the personal training pers uh, is important and pre preparing the municipality for national and international funding is very important, especially in international funding, preparation of the projects are very important. If you don't have ready projects, if you don't have any feasibility, if the project has not been drawn, these projects takes very long time, maybe one year, two year to be implemented. And the international funds do not have the luxury of waiting so long, so the funds cannot be used properly. So we are trying to uh, accelerate the preparation of the municipalities. The climate uh, impact is very important. Part of the technical support to municipalities, for example, uh, uh, the waste, uh, solid waste management plans. 
until 2050, municipality of Gaziantep's investment in solid waste and technologies are explained in a guideline, guide document. We believe this is very important for the municipalities and hopefully we will try to those uh, support those investments similarly in the city of Hatay uh, which is a neighboring city we have finished a carbon footprint action plan this involves public private sector and the uh, uh, local people it goes even beyond the Paris Treaty it is going to decrease the carbon release in this action plan this has been presented to the municipality of Hatay. We need new approaches. The extreme problems can only be solved with extreme solutions. And those extreme solutions are when we make a technology or an investment, rather than just meeting the need, we need to consider climate and climate change. In, and that should be sustainable and it should be an uh, income generating uh, activity and it should not bring an extra burden to the municipality and since the beginning I'm very proud to say that since the very beginning we have been working with the municipality they are the heroes. We are just trying to do our best to support them, and I believe we have reached a good point. Thank you very much, Sartaj. The migration and displacement, you talked about our work about the migration and displacement. Actually, we are talking about integrated approach. When we look at the waste, solid waste management, uh, apart from environmental dimension, it has economic and social dimensions. Do you think you, your work will have a social impact? Actually, in the solid waste in Turkey, we know that there is a reality in Turkey. In the solid waste, there is a social reality and zero waste is the policy of the state and actually the numbers are improving with the current resources it's 11 percent and now we are trying to raise this or proportion uh, and the social dimension is the street garbage collectors there we have some research about that and i as far as i know the ministry is going to make a solution there's an informal economy and there are about 150 to 200,000 street garbage collectors. This is an informal economy, and it's known that most of them are Syrians or refugees. So there is some work to turn this informal economy into a formal economy, but we don't have any other work on that. Uh, International uh, Development Cooperation Agency, and they have a huge role in raising awareness uh, on uh, this phenomenon. Uh, migration and also uh, in displacement issues. Could you please tell us uh, your experience, uh, how you uh, integrate, accelerate the integration of the refugees and migrants within your own societies? Thank you very much. Buenos dias, good morning, good evening, and thanks, uh, Seher. Uh, I would like to start uh, thanking the organizer of the forum on behalf of the Andalusian Agency for International Cooperation uh, for the invitation to share with you uh, what we do from the field of uh, international cooperation and to offer us the possibility to learn from you. Uh, last April, uh, we began to la the elaboration of our third uh, international cooperation master plan that will cover uh, the year 2020 to 2023. For its formulation, uh, we have organized several meetings with the main stakeholders in the cooperation policy in Andalusia. We call the process Andalusian Dialogues in the framework of the Agenda 2030. The UNDP, uh, I, I look to Juan Carlos López, who has, uh, who has been the chief of, the, of this uh, companion process. Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the UNDP has accompanied us in, the, in this uh, reflection process. The plan is now in the final process, uh, process of approval. 
had I had to highlight uh, significant features of the plant, I would say the alignment with the uh, 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals, uh, both uh, from actions uh, to be carried out in third countries, in our we call priority third countries for the, uh, international cooperation, and those actions aim to uh, target the population in Andalusia. Other feature I would like to highlight is the emphasis in, on the coherence of policy for sustainable development and uh, the search for multi-actor and multi-level strategic alliance, uh, aware that compliance with the 2030 agenda implies sharing responsibilities. And also the integration of gender, environmental sustainability and climate change approaches, as well as territorial approach and human rights approach. Uh, the general objective of our plan is to contribute to the, fight, to, to the fight against poverty, inequality and to the promotion of human sustainable development within the path of the 2030 Agenda. On the one hand, the strategy of what we do in our priority countries is based on sharing our experience, our capacities, our development model to foster the generation of development process and in working together in the localization and achievement of the sustainable development goals in their territories. From the area of humanitarian action, the plan focuses on coordination between humanitarian action, uh, actors and uh, among them and the development actors, uh, looking for synergies among humanitarian and development uh, areas. The plan also incorporates the resilience and prevention action, actions in a transversal way in all development actions. On the other hand, uh, what we do in Andalusia, oh, I would like to go deep in this point, uh, our objective in this area uh, is to contribute to form a global citizenship. citizenship. Uh, a citizenship, a citizenship uh, is a people people and form a commitment to human sustainable development on a planetary scale. It's, I, would say, I should say that it is a concept of population, of citizenship, that has a sense of belonging to a whole community. The strategy is based on the promotion of actions to raise public awareness and to include in the educational system values, skills, methodologies aimed at action to achieve a better world. So in this area, the plan uh, highlights measures related to mobility in general and forced migration in particular. So uh, I, I would say that uh, I fully agree with uh, what uh, Jamil said. Our perception, attitudes and ideas about migration are based on our direct experience, also in direct experience, and we, don't, uh, we have uh, taken to, into account that is based also on the message we receive from the media. So much of the racist and xenophobic uh, <coughs> attitudes are caused by misinformation. So for example, from January 2015 to May of this year, almost uh, 15,700 and accompanying minors, we call MENA in, in Spanish, have been attended in Andalusia. And of those, only 0.52% have had any contact with crime. This means that only one in 2,000 children have legal measures for some crime. Despite this data, uh, an accompanying minors has become the focus of uh, attacks against the migration population. So I must say that Andalusia, oh, uh, let me say that Andalusia is the, the region in Spain, the south of Spain, with more accompanying minors uh, registered in, the, in its protection and guardianship system. Um, we, uh, I think Andalusia assume almost the 40% of the minors in Spain, minors and accompanying minors. Aware of the problem, uh, we recognize our duty to transform its perception by fostering the understanding of the causes of forced displacement and the treatment of migration as a right. 
uh, to this aim, the plan includes actions uh, in coordination with all the departments uh, of the Andalusian government, especially with the immigrant department <laughs> and the, the, um, the department uh, that work with childhood and youth and with the government centers uh, in competence with education. Among these at, uh, at actions, I would highlight the incorporation of mechanisms to address negative messages of mobility uh, and forced migration uh, into university studies in communication and journalism, actions to make visible the causes of the forced migration and reinforce the idea of migration as a right, not as a problem, and the creation of an ethical committee to ensure the application of the journalist code of ethics. And also, um, we are uh, working on uh, campaigns of sensitivity that uh, aim to inform population. So now we are working with uh, some uh, international agen uh, agencies as uh, the International Organization Migration in a... <coughs> conference that is going to take place in Seville uh, on this subject, on the, on the subject of integration, how to integrate, especially uh, minors and attending. So. Thank you very much, Carmen. Uh, indeed, uh, migration and displacement requires a collective action of all stakeholders, actors at all levels, local, regional and national. And this is very important because we have limited resources, we need to use it efficiently. And also it is very critical to ensure that we leave no one behind. We don't leave no one behind. So thank you very much for your kind contributions. Son panelistimize geçmek istiyorum izninizle. So uh, I would like to pass the microphone to our last uh, last uh, panelist and Mr. Baran uh, and is will be talking about the uh, air pollution and he were they published an air air quality report just recently and now I would like to get their opinion about this air quality and its relation with the migration. So I would like to thank the UNDP, Gaziantep Municipality and uh, all the other stakeholders for organizing such a such a nice uh, nice uh, event actually. And actually I think you have already seen the publications of the UNDP and uh, it is not an easy job, it's not an overnight job actually to develop to create such nice publications and uh, therefore I would like to congratulate to all of these uh, act actors and so I, w I would like to emphasize that these uh, the, the, and these uh, migration practices is uh, closely related to the local practice as well and it's also actually the environmental problems has al also worsened and uh, continue to climb with the uh, with the introduction of the migration movement in, uh, in our country and as you know that air quality uh, air quality uh, is a problem and use uh, and is a uh, is a chronic problem of our country country and and especially during the winter season and uh, to get together with the burning uh, burning uh, with the burners so air quality and especially dust emission and air quality problem is uh, is worse uh, compared to uh, average in Europe and uh, in and actually we have to Two point uh, particle, uh, particle two point five uh, in, in parameter is is also problem for the southern part of our country and the, especially unfortunately the stations in the, located in the south part of the country does not uh, do not uh, measure this. Uh, this is uh, a 2.5 uh, uh, ppm parameter for the dust and uh, for the dust emissions especially in the Gaziantep, Şanlıurfa and Hatay where these dust emissions are really very high and it is really it is it is really uh, true that, that there are environmental air quality problems especially in the areas where the migration is an issue and guys like the Gaziantep, Şanlıurfa, Mersin and when we look at the to these provinces 
this guy is compared to others. Gaziantep is on the right path and having some uh, and have some some improvements after the uh, introduction of the natural gas uh, here. And however, in Mersin, for example, including the migrant migrants, and um, unfortunately, uh, the the people of Mersin have to inhalate the polluted uh, air uh, for 300 days of a year. And for the Shanla, Shanla in Shanluarfa, it is 181 days, and it is 305 days in Adana. And there, unfortunately, there is an increase, and this increase seems to be worsening in the next years and next coming years. And however, when we look at the water quality potential of Turkey, and we have 112 billion cubic meter potential uh, usable water availability exists in Turkey, and unfortunately, we see that there is a tendency for uh, for uh, being a uh, what uh, water uh, poor country, and unfor unfortunately, and it is it was foreseen that by 2050, uh, and it was supposed that the Turkish population will be increasing to 100 million pe people, and together with the involvement of this migrant population, I think it will be much more, and this uh, in increase uh, on the population side will be also establishing and bringing an extra burden on the water availability and the potable water and usable water uh, capacity of the water. And uh, there are also uh, some in important statistics showing the loss of uh, of the water in the pipelines, and that's why that we need to. There is an urgent need for for renovating the infrastructures and the conveyance lines. And unfortunately, unfortunately, we see that the water treatment is a costly issue and there is important important uh, level of water loss uh, while treating the water and wastewater and therefore and some improvements are also needed uh, on the water treatment side as well. And the same story goes on for the Hatay, for Mersin and for Adana as well. And sometimes we experience the flood and together with the climate change, these natural disasters and emergencies will be also climbing in the next years. And therefore, we need to we need to make more resilient smart cities, starting from the savage uh, system systems to uh, stormwater collection channels, and also in, inclu including. And I would like to. I would like to show you an, a correct uh, management of the cor correct management and uh, of the city and uh, starting from the worker of a municipality up to decision makers. So everybody should uh, be should be on the uh, correct uh, side and therefore therefore we need to have an urban practice that prioritizes climate change and also uh, the mig uh, migration and uh, especially when. We we uh, think the uh, climate change and uh, air quality together, we see that especially the disadvantaged and vulnerable uh, segment of the society really uh, is af are affected worse than the n compared to other n normal people. And there therefore, there is an urgent need for investing more on, on these uh, areas. I know that uh, there will be a declaration at the end of this forum here, and I have I, I had the opportunity to uh, look at the uh, draft uh, draft version of this final declaration declaration proposal and however still I have I will be having some uh, proposals and the recommendations as as well and especially uh, the for for establishing the best practices and like the technology trans transfer exchange of the good practices between the uh, cities should be encouraged and therefore and uh, sustainable and the continuous cooperation environment and the networking activities should be per performed between the cities and like the like uh, and the, the, there should there should be promotions for the cleaner cl cleaner uh, technologies like the and as especially especially instead of providing the call to the people there should be other mechanisms for decreasing the cost of the electricity of the na or the natural natural gas in order to contribute to air uh, cleanliness of the city thank you very much for 
giving me this opportunity. And uh, really, thank you, thank you very much for the statistics that you shares, uh, you have shared. Even though they are worrying statistics indeed, and of course we in, we cannot say that it is not it it is not my concern because uh, env environment is something that touches to uh, each of uh, us and to the life of each of us, and therefore starting from the NGOs to the individuals to the citizens, we have a really major major uh, uh, roles and responsibilities in uh, indeed. And thank you very much as well for the recommendations and the proposals for the draft uh, version of the uh, of the declaration. And however, I would like to remind you that it will be a living document, and that, therefore there will be continuous co continuous contribution and involvement uh, of the document will be possible through the next series of the uh, forums. And thank you very much to all of you, all the speakers and all the panelists. And I, I think we have only two minutes left. I don't know. I, I didn't receive any question. And however, still, I would like to ask to our uh, audience here whether they have any question or not that they would like to address to the panelists. Hi, uh, my name is Salal Haideri. I'm from the Rotterdam municipality, the Netherlands. Actually, I'm wondering about the surveys if you have hold in Turkey about the support of the locals of the migration issue. Can you tell us about the surveys and, and if there is any change, you know, at the beginning and later? Surveys, I'm asking the panelists because mostly the uh, I can ask Sir. Uh, can you please Sir elaborate Tachin. a little bit more like surveys? Uh, what kind type of surveys are, are you? Uh, about you know the, lo the, the local support. I mean support by um, how they think about migration issue at the, the beginning to, and later. To local people. Uh -huh, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah the, it, the views of it, yeah. yeah. This is this is uh, I actually a lot of us uh, can can answer that, but uh, uh, migration is difficult. Especially if you're a local person, that uh, especially in this part of Turkey, because it's already the poorest part of Turkey, uh, and uh, and a refugee comes and and uh, and lives among you. Already there is a competition of the work, labor, and there is a language barrier and everything. Uh, but uh, I believe you were here since yesterday that uh, the Turkish government is coping with this uh, quite immensely. Uh, there is a free education, free health care for the, for the refugees, for the local population, of course. It's uh, challenging on the labor markets uh, because um, there's illegal labor. Um, it's a reality that uh, the refugees are uh, working with a less salary than, than the regular Turks. So, so Turkish citizens are, are some, some part of Turkey they lost their jobs due to that. So there is a social tension. But in order to eliminate the social tension, Together with Turkish government, local authorities, international NGOs, and NGOs, international organization, organizations working together to keep social cohesion together. Uh, otherwise, the social tension is very dangerous thing in between two communities. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you, Sartaj. I think I remember the survey that you mentioned. It is Inge's survey. Yeah, yeah. The views of the host communities uh, about uh, the Syrian uh, population and how they see us, the whole situation. Of course, uh, we come. This is the eighth year of the uh, just crisis in Turkey. The numbers uh, have gradually uh, grown, and this had lots of impacts on the lives of the host communities, as also. Uh, Sartaj uh, summarized. So uh, the results are not so much positive uh, because the tensions uh, are increasing within the communities. In some parts it is high, in some parts it is low, but uh, it is clear that there is an uh, issue and uh, both the government, the local authorities, the civil society organizations, public sector, uh, need to have a collective response on that one. And it is not an easy thing. But it requires some time, it's a process. But I believe that uh, since you know the two communities have lots of things in common in terms of culture, in terms of social issues, uh, uh, there will be some uh, good uh, results out of it. But all of the uh, actions that the local uh, authorities, the international organizations are doing has a social cohesion component. This is at the heart of it. 
and it is very recognized, I think, by all parties, including public and uh, private. Thank you. Do we have uh, additional uh, questions, comments, remarks? Merhabalar. Uh... Thank you very much, first of all, for the organizers for organizing such a nice uh, incident, uh, ML Kaish, and coming from the environmental, Contr uh, environmental control and management department of the Gaziantep uh, Metropolitan Municipality. And I would like to thank to UNDP and uh, as already mentioned, so uh, and actually as already mentioned, uh, and so and environmental impact. We have 500,000 uh, migrants uh, in our uh, sit city, and of course, uh, and JICA and the UN and the UNDP, UNDP has helped for environmental environmental part of our uh, issue, and we have really realized uh, good uh, achievements. And however, as already mentioned by Mr. Baran, on the air quality level and on the environmental level, as a representative of the municipality and so I would like to ha remark uh, on our challenges that we experience on the air quality uh, for example and so as a province uh, and in, on the on the general and we have forbidden the use of coal and under the decision of a municipality. And unfortunately, on the rural part of the city uh, and transition to natural gas is very problematic, as you know, and you cannot pressure, uh, pressurize these people for shifting uh, to, uh, to natural gas. And there are migrant people, of course, living in the, suburban, in the suburbs of the city and and these uh, areas uh maybe uh, this is sometimes uh, they, they they may c consider it as a monetary aid and which is not okay for the UN policies and therefore I think uh, uh, UN should be more flexible on some issues uh, like uh, like helping the, we, as, as I said we uh, mentioned before we have uh, 50, 50 uh, 500 thousand uh, 500 thousand uh, migrants and half of them uh, living in the stove heated uh, houses and uh, and they they burn coal and actually and sometimes they can even they cannot even afford uh, coal and they burn whatever they could get from the uh, waste ma waste collection areas it can be plastics and it can be rubber and uh, anything they could handle and that, therefore uh, and this problem is not unique to Gaziantep of course and there are other uh, other provinces as well and therefore we expect uh, help from the UN agencies uh, on this issue and actually uh, we are discussing about the different aspect of the uh, of the issue in the eight in the in the eighth year of this issue and therefore we need to, to we there is an urgent need for talking about the its impact on sustainable development on the environmental issues and of course the measures uh, such measures uh, should also take priority in the agenda of the UN and its agencies as well. Is there any other comment or question? I think no. And uh, I would like to thank to all of you. It was the last uh, panel of these two days. And I would like to thank each panelist for your dearest cont contributions. And thank you very much and enjoy your lunch. Thank you.